This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. As part of our ongoing series on financial repression, I have John Malden joining us this morning from Dallas. John is a very well-recognized financial author and writer and publisher. Amongst other things, Thoughts from the Front Line, which I believe to be the most widely read investment newsletter in the world and, of course, outside the box. John, welcome. Good to be here, Gordon. Thank you. I appreciate you giving us the time on the, on this subject. I know there'll be a lot of interest from our followers and what you have to say on this subject. But John, for those that aren't familiar with your work and the things you've done, can you just give them a, our listeners a brief overview of your background and why you get into writing in the in the first place? Well, I started uh, my current version of, of this letter 16 years ago, uh, next month, and. Mostly was just to put my thoughts down on paper to coalesce things, and the, we stuck it on the internet as an afterthought, and it just took off. Uh, people started subscribing, and somebody said, "Well, can I send it to my list?" And you know, all of a sudden, it took off. Next thing you know, you've got a million closest friends, and uh, it's it's been a it's been a real fun uh, thing. It's changed my business model, it, uh, and it changed my world. And I've been very happy about it. We now have a publishing company. Malden Economics, uh, where I have a whole team of writers that works with me, plus uh, my various uh, investment referral services. So my life stays pretty busy. You were mentioning you just have another book coming out, I believe? I've got my sixth or seventh book coming out. It will be coming out next week. Uh, this, this one's going to be different. It's just going to be online, and it's going to be on China. And I've got 15 of some of the best experts in the world on China. Uh, I'm co-authoring it with my associate, uh, Worth Ray, uh, for the introduction and, and the work that we've done uh, in putting it together. But we're going to do it a little bit different. Rather than bringing up this, you know, expensive book, it's going to be $8.99 on Amazon or iTunes or, or Nook. Don't want to forget Barnes and Noble. And I'm just curious as to what kind of sales we'll have for a, a an ebook only. So this is my this is my way of asking a marketing question. Well, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll find out. One of the things I enjoy, John, about your work, your writings, not just what you have to say, but you you really do bring some of the finest experts in the world on subjects in into into the folio. I, people I hadn't heard of before that have some great things to say. So I, I compliment you, John. Thanks. Let's let's just jump right into this because I want to make sure we have enough time. Financial repression. How would you define it? What does it mean to you? How do you think about it? Well, the book that I wrote just before last, Code Red, that came out about a year and a half ago, is really all about financial repression. And what we were talking about then was uh, the coming currency wars, which is, we're now beginning to see play out. And by that, and by financial repression, when we were writing it about it then, we were talking about central banks driving down the uh, interest rates on your savings so they're trying to force retirees and savers into other types of investments that take more risk but because they want them to move out the risk curve because they think if they get people to move out the risk curve then that will spur the economy uh, and what they in my view falsely they don't understand is that uh, by taking money from savers then that's money that we can't, we savers can't use to consume. We have to change our spending patterns. Uh, so they're really robbing from Peter to pay Paul. But in this case, Paul is banks and uh, uh, Wall Street interest, and and uh, it's not the guy out on Main Street. I, interest rates can sometimes be low for natural reasons, and they can be uh, low for very long times. We've seen that in the past. But when central banks start messing around in the market, they change the price of money, and it has all sorts of unintended consequences. Uh, sometimes those 
unintended consequences are good, but sometimes they're not so good. So, especially when it's for such a protracted period of time that we've had zero the zero bounds. You know, you get mispricing of risk, you get malinvestment, you just get all sorts of distortions. It's lack of price discovery that starts to come in. And you know, you mentioned savers. I have so many friends of mine that retired that are being forced back to work because they're not making the returns that they had planned on and they thought they'd been conservative. That's money they're not spending. And that's to the tune of about a half a trillion dollars that's come out of the, the savers, the pensioners that's moved into to those that are highly leveraged, et cetera. I mean, is that a fair, do you agree with that observation or are you seeing well, it? I, I do. I mean, I happen to think the, for one of the reasons you just mentioned, that the Federal Reserve will start raising rates uh, this fall, September, uh, October meeting, precisely because they don't want to see the seventh anniversary of zero interest rates. I mean, this is an unprecedented period. Um, and we can talk about, uh, uh, if you want to talk about inflation, why I think they, they may end up raising them a little bit faster, and they should. Um, but it's, it's, it's created an extraordinary uh, set of malinvestments. I mean, let's take one unintended consequences that actually turned out to be pretty good in that they made money really cheap for a bunch of Texas oil men. And when you give cheap money to Texans, they punch holes in the ground and they just kept punching. And so they moved to out away from the central uh, oil place. Now they moved out on the edge because it was easier to get because those uneconomic plays at $50, $60, $70 oil all of a sudden become economic at 100 And you could get the rights to that. So, okay, wow, I can go drill here. I mean, punch a hole because they couldn't get the good stuff, but they could get the stuff on the edges, and they started punching holes in the ground that drove the price of rigs up and called, drove the price of production up. And now we got a lot of jobs, we got a lot of investment. Ultimately, we've seen the price of oil come down, which I think is pretty good for the global economy. But without that cheap money, I still think we would have seen production rise in the U.S because technology is making it easier to get oil out of the out of the ground now in, in more productive places. I mean, I've got friends here in Dallas that they are producing oil and they say we're profitable down to 40. Um, there are the places where we're punching, there's just a lot of oil and it's cheap to bring up. Now you can't go 10 miles away. So it's not that we're not going to have production of oil at $40. We're just not going to get the same frenetic uh, uh, amount of drilling that we would at 80 or 100. So it, it's, it changed it changed behaviors. Um, and now we're going to have to deal with that investment coming off. We've changed uh, how, how we think the world works. Now we've forced Saudi Arabia into producing more to maintain market share. We'll see how all that works out. It may work out for the best. I mean, having lower oil prices doesn't hurt me. I don't own an oil well. My only connection to the, uh, to the oil price is when I go to the gas pump. But that's a, that's a possibly positive unintended consequence, but it certainly is hurting investors. It's hurting the people that I talk with that, you know, they're moving into high yield bonds, and, and now it's, we, we are issuing the most risky high yield bonds, far more risky than we were in 2006 and 2007, yeah. uh, at, 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 with less covenants, like we didn't learn anything, and because people are going, I've, I've got to have more yield, I can't survive. We, we have bond funds where people are chasing longer duration bond funds and if interest rates on the long end of the curve rose by one percent these long duration bond funds which are now the two of the biggest I mean two, the two biggest uh, uh, funds in the world could lose 20 percent mm -hmm. and investors in their 401ks and wherever they're going look at it and go if they lose 20 percent they'll just panic 
and they'll hit the sell button. And because we wrote a bill called Frank Dodd that has basically said, you banks can't get involved in providing liquidity to this market because we don't want you to take the risk. So now they've shoved the risk to small investors who will all try to get out the door at the same time. And there won't be anybody on the other end of sale. We'll, we'll end up having a liquidity crisis. It would not surprise me in the next crisis, and I'm not predicting it will be this week or next year or two years, but it will happen. It wouldn't surprise me to see the Federal Reserve step in and start directly funding, um, or as direct as you can, mutual funds and ETFs trying to uh, uh, provide liquidity uh, into a panicking market. and. If you thought there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth about people uh, funding banks, when you start funding mutual funds, I mean, we don't even know if we've got a mechanism for that. Uh, they, all of these unintended consequences that they create. Yeah, the explosion in, in, in not just mutual funds, but ETFs trading global. Oh, it's huge. huge. It's just massive. and. There's a liquid. We already see a serious liquidity problem here in the bond market, and uh, somebody just has to shove fire in the theater and 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 bar the doors, and there's a problem. When it's going to happen, who knows? But John, you know, you you talk about Texans cheap money just bumping holes in the ground everywhere and, and producing. You know, I know you do a lot of global traveling. I do, and I what I've seen is the same thing globally, and that is quantitative easing brought demand forward. That's the whole idea. And but when demand comes forward, supply goes to pick it up immediately. Builds and and especially when money's cheap, you don't have to have saved it. You can go and get it. So Asia, emerging markets, just built for this extended capacity, uh, because of the increase in consumption or at least hope consumption. Now I'm seeing it slow or the well, expectations and all of a sudden commodity prices as you said oil dropping it, to me it's the same scenario but on a global basis am I right in that I, I think you're right in, in the book we've got coming out in, in a few weeks we cite a study by uh, the BIS that is projecting uh, some nine trillion dollars that emerging markets have borrowed in dollar terms so yeah, they, in dollar they, terms. they've borrowed the dollar, uh, they're making their money in local currency terms, but they borrowed in dollars, so they're going to have to pay back in dollars, and as the dollar is getting stronger against their local currency, because now we're seeing a strong dollar uh, uh, movement, which by the way, a year and a half ago, while the dollar was still falling, I said in code red, the dollar is going to get stronger than any of us can possibly imagine. I mean, it's going to shock you. By the way, we just broke, broke a 30-year trend here in the last week uh, with the dollar rising. There is nowhere but up it, from a technician standpoint. It's the ultimate in a short squeeze, is it not? All these emerging <laughs> markets, low currencies, more than a dollar? Part of it's a short squeeze. Part of it is um, Japan is just continuing to uh, print money, and they're going to print more money. And then when that hasn't worked, they'll print even more money. I mean, they they have a sovereign debt crisis that the only way they can solve it is to trash their currency and to move the uh, debt that they've generated from banks and pension funds onto the balance sheet of the central bank. That's that's their only solution. And so today, the 10-year JGB market, uh, that's the Japanese bond market, used to be one of the most liquid markets in the world. Today, if the Bank of Japan is not buying, there are no trades. You will see days, if the Bank of Japan is not in the market, there are no trades. That's just shocking. And that's only going to put pressure on currencies all over the world. Now the European Bank is stepping in. Uh, they're going to be printing money. We've got the uh, U.S. government getting ready to raise rates, that's going to make the dollar go even more. It's going to, to unend this carry trade where everybody was buying these $9 trillion. And then there's going to be a rush to try to find dollars to pay that $9 trillion back. Uh, this is a movie that we just doesn't don't think ends well. I was going to ask you, what do you see on the horizon here? What's the likely scenario? Uh, the likely scenario is that we see a, com a couple of countries have a major crisis. Uh, 
will it roll from country to country? Possibly. I mean, hopefully it won't be 1998. I think actually you're going to see the Federal Reserve providing swap lines to central banks around the world, to emerging market central banks, so that they can provide them the dollars, they can actually find the dollars. Uh, but it's it's going to expand kind of the off-book balance sheet. I don't, I don't even, that's not even a term, I don't know quite how to say that. But the U.S. Federal Reserve is authorized uh, and has already set in place a lot of these swamp lines and I think that's likely to see it but it's going to it's going to make the dollar go higher because it will be in to use your words kind of a really odd short squeeze is that people have to scramble to find dollars to pay their loans back. John what I know you don't give investment advice but generally what should what should investors be doing right now what should they what should be front and center on their minds? Today, uh, they're focused on risk. I would, the, the letter I wrote just last week, it's a free letter, you can go to John, you know, Mullet Economics and subscribe to Thoughts from the Frontline, where I'm talking about World War D, World War Deflation. And then, and outside the box that I'm actually writing, I just stopped writing it to talk with you, uh, where uh, my outside the box is I always send somebody else's work, and this is a friend of mine, Steve Blumenthal, where he just has eight or nine different charts talking about valuations in the U.S. stock market. And they're at levels that you have to be concerned. You have to start thinking, how do I hedge my risk? And I think at these levels, investors should, should start saying, what is my exit strategy? I'm not saying get out. I'm saying have a methodology that says, how am I going to protect the profits that I've made? I we have to look and realize that um, the uh, central bank in Europe is printing. It's likely that market's going to go up for another year and a half, two years, maybe shift a lot of your equity money that uh, is in the U.S. shifted into Europe. Um, you know, I wouldn't uh, think that uh, uh, with a rising dollar, you normally wouldn't say buy gold, but you can buy gold in terms of yen. And there are some ETFs out there where you can do that. So it's short yen, long gold, and that's done very well over the last uh, uh, year and a half, two years. Far better than if you would have just bought uh, gold in dollar terms. So there are ways to play this. Uh, I look for more income opportunities. Maybe you want hard assets in real estate that are going to be able to produce income for you. Uh, if you have enough money, start looking at some of the private equity offerings that are around. Gordon, you know this, uh, sometimes the best place to invest is in your own backyard and in businesses that you know, uh, in opportunities that you can see and touch. Uh, that's, where the real, that's where the real wealth in America is created, is in small businesses. It's interesting you say that, because it's exactly where I spend a lot of my time. I call them dirty businesses. Baby yeah. boomers retiring, the kids are, don't want to be part of the business, and, and dad's got to move out. But the margins are phenomenal, and they're they're there. But they're not they're privately held, and they're they're they take some management. It's a different world than the, than the secure than just the normal securities market. John, I really appreciate your your time here today, and I know we could we could go on. Are there some key messages you would like to leave with our listeners? Well, the one message we haven't talked about is that I think the world is in a big race. I think it's in a race between how much wealth will governments and central banks destroy versus how much wealth is man going to create. We are in a marvelous age of transformation. Uh, and I'll be, I write about that from time to time, and that will be a book on where I'm talking about accelerating change. And the world is going to change so much over the next 20 years, I think, vastly for the better. We're going to have so many, not just toys, but cures for cancer and, and liver disease and heart disease. We're all going to live longer, so I would suggest you guys, instead of your friends talking about, well, I had to come out of retirement, I'd just say, stay out of retirement, don't retire. Uh, the, uh, I mean, you know, keep in the game. Sometimes uh, uh, you didn't get old uh, because you retired, you retired and you got old, so, so uh, you know, stay in the game. 
I've been, in, I've been in technology all my life, and I've never seen it more exciting than it is now. Oh, I, I, know, I see, I see a difficult. I see some difficult times in front of us for sure. But on the other side of that, the innovation and the on the globalized basis of the education and and the workforce that we have, the future is phenomenal. But it's going to be very ugly, John. I think in the short term, which is why investors need to figure out how to get their assets to the other side of this crisis. Right. That may be three years, five years, whatever, but we will hit the reset button. We will deal with this sovereign debt. And on the other side of that, I think the secular bear market, the world changes, and then we go into a secular bull market, and it gets to be 1982 again, and we get a great run. We'll all be geniuses. I feel I feel very same. I, I All these crises that we could talk about quite extensively here, are really change trying to happen. Old yeah. systems, the Bretton Woods, the IMF, the world, a lot of these structures no longer work in a new rebalanced global economy and they're trying to change. The AIIB Foundation Infrastructure Investment Bank in, in, in Asia is a good example of that kind of thing. And if we would endorse some of these changes and lead them, we'd be better off. But that's not the nature, human nature, is it? We just, we wait for a crisis and then we're forced to react. And but. Don't I, I? I'm still optimistic, like you, and I share your confidence, John. I'll, I really appreciate your time. I know we could talk a lot more, but um, I asked you for for 25 minutes, and we've already taken it. So thank you very much. We got to have you back fast again. 20, fast 25 minutes, and uh, if people want to get my, I'll, I'll do a quick plug. Uh, nope. Find out about my books or get my letter. It's free. Just go to Malden Economics or Google John Malden. Put your email in and you'll be one of my one million closest friends. Gordon, thanks for having me on. Thank you very much, John. Catch you again. Okay. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. 